Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Megan Santangelo, and today we are joined by James Kay, our Director of Risk and Underwriting. And today, James will discuss how you can effectively detect threats and mitigate risk to better protect you and your merchants. As a reminder, the phone lines will remain muted until the close of the presentation. So if you have any questions in the meantime, please use the chat and Q&A features, and we'll address those once James is done presenting. So James, if you're ready, I'll hand this over to you so we can get started. Well, thanks, Megan. I appreciate that. Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I've been the Director of Risk and Underwriting with EPI for about eight years. I've been in this industry for 15 years. It's a long time, but I've learned a whole bunch. Um, in this webinar, we're going to be covering some key areas. Um, in underwriting and the risk world and how it pertains to detecting and mitigating fraud uh, on the front end and on the back end. Um, I'll be discussing uh, why our underwriting procedures are important, important, what documentation to include in your submission to help with our, our reviews. Uh, we'll be touching on how to identify fraud accounts uh, on the ground floor, what you guys can do to identify fraud accounts and kind of what we see to identify fraud accounts. And for the risk portion of it, I'll be talking about what is risk, why it's important, the different types of risk and fraud that we see, uh, a lot of red the, the red flags that we do see, we want you guys to take from this and educate your merchants, um, any new customers that you bring on board. Uh, it always helps, the more education, the better. Uh, the importance of knowing your customer, and then how we mitigate risk through our reviews and, and kind of what we do. <clears throat> so we'll start off with the underwriting procedures. So our philosophy is to approve bona fide high quality merchants to accept credit cards as quickly as possible. Verifying the business and signer is paramount, as you might expect. Verifying the business and the signer are not only bank re requirements, but it reduces losses that merchants may suffer, electronic payments may suffer. Uh, we do that through online searches, reviewing documentation and reviewing the credit report. You can help too. If you receive an online or phone lead, just do a cursory search to make sure the business is real. Of course, if you're walking into the business and the person is physically signing with you, it's totally unnecessary. Secondly, we pull the FICO, uh, pull the FICO on all merchants. There are a select few where we generally do not need the FICO, uh, but we will request the or require the driver's license or state issued ID card in place of it. Um, does the personal credit impact an approval? It does. The credit report does allow us to assess the merchant's financial character and their willingness or unwillingness to pay debt. Um, if the merchant is struggling paying debts, we might end up being just another paid debt, and we don't want that to happen. Efficiency. We try to be as efficient as possible. Our goal is to reduce the amount of back and forth regarding documentation, which allows us to approve quicker. It makes you guys happier. We do our best to research in our end and ask for all documentation upfront, so you only need to go to the merchant once. Sometimes additional information is needed, even after we receive initial documentation. Sometimes more questions may arise. And unqualified businesses. So we do have the uh, we do have the unacceptable merchant list. It's available on the ISO interface under the documents section. Unfortunately, there's no debate about unqualified businesses as the policy is set by the bank. The bank has taken massive losses in some industries such as timeshare resellers, loan modifications, and others are against Visa and Mastercard regulations such as adult products and services. Um, unfortunately. CBD and Kratom and Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10, Delta 100, anything that's containing THC, all that stuff is still unqualified on the Wells Fargo side of it. Um, I know we are working uh, towards a, a greener future, and uh, we are hoping that we can uh, board these kinds of businesses in the future, in the near future, uh, through our Sigma platform. Uh, we'll make sure everyone's going to be notified uh, about that. Um, the smoke shops are the ones that, that are the biggest thing here. Uh, we try our very best to approve them. Uh, we're hoping, you know, we, we hope that 
all the smoke shops update their marketing just to remove any pictures showing the kratom or, or anything that's containing THC. Um, in addition to that, what we have found works is a, a statement from the merchant, a signed statement stating that they're no longer or they are not accepting credit card for these items, that they're not accepting any payments on a credit card for CBD, Kratom, Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10. Um, and that's, that is signed and provided to us for the underwriting package and it's also posted at the register. When we have that and when we have Fiserv that comes in and says, hey, you know, this merchant has Kratom all over the place, we provide them that, they have not pushed back on us for those kinds of things. So documentation, like I said, our first step is to verify the business. And to do that, we have to follow, we have to follow our guidelines. The first thing is we have a completed merchant processing agreement. We look for a completed MPA that includes a tax ID, correct business and owner for ownership information, ownership equity. It must be 50%, it can be split up, but we need to have a minimum of 50% to approve an application. Um, or there has to be a corporate resolution design, designating an authorized signer to be used. Um, accurate annual volume and, uh, and accurate swipe and key estimates along with site survey information. Um, a beneficial ownership is required for anyone owning 25% or more of the business that is not listed on the MPA. Uh, this is a bank requirement. This is not a, 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 an EPI only requirement. Um, this is a strictly a bank requirement, and they're very hard on that one. Um, any merchant signing from the state of Maryland uh, generally needs to fill out the Maryland ETF addendum. Um, it simply states that an ETF exists, required even if you're not enforcing one. Um, we generally approve accounts without the without the ETF addendum. However, uh, it is required down the line, so we can approve it, get the account in. Uh, up and running and just have the merchant sign off on it, you know, after the fact. <clears throat> We've documents to confirm the business at the location, uh, a utility bill, lease agreement, pictures, corporation paperwork, et cetera, are important to submit with the deal. If it's a food truck or something like that, just take a picture of the truck. Uh, that's always very helpful. Um, if the signs are not ready yet, maybe the, the, the plans for the sign uh, with the, the advertising company that's making the sign, that always helps. Um, a business license or a permit, it could be a tax certificate, a health inspection, or a liquor license, anything that has the merchant's business name and address that was issued by the state, uh, city, local, you know, local municipality. Uh, previous processing or bank statements, those are helpful and may be able to confirm the business at the address as well. A website used for marketing purposes helps. And of course, if it's an e-commerce only merchant, it is, or not even only, but if it's e-commerce at all, um, that they're gonna be accepting payments online, it's required along with the terms and conditions, privacy, refund, and shipping policies. Um, we need to make sure that the volumes and the key percentages make sense for the industry. We ask, uh, we ask for these documents and this information because we cannot find them or are unable to verify the business using our resources. We are required to have documentation on file for each merchant we board. The more you're able to submit on the front end, the better we can do our job. And the less back and forth we have, the quicker the accounts get approved. So the next step is verifying the signer. So how do we do that? Uh, the merchants are required to sign the the personal guarantee, uh, the MPA and the confirmation page. So sections 10, 11 in the confirmation page of the MPA. Um, this provides us permission to pull credit and match and shows us the merchant is willing to guarantee the account. And those PGs only come into play when the merchant has any kind of you know, unfunded refunds or unfunded fees, unfunded chargebacks. So if the business operates and tends to operate as it should in a traditional manner, where they're paying their fees every month, signing a PG should be no big deal. Um, sending in the driver's license is really helpful. It helps us validate signatures and it confirms the home address. Um, it's also one of the most common things the bad guys fake. And usually they're pretty bad at it. Uh, we find more fraud using the driver's license, especially with, the, with business ID theft. Uh, we've seen driver's licenses that just look 
they they look like a kindergartner did them or it looks like some high tech computer did them and they look too clean and too perfect and those are all you know those are all red flags of course provide the merchant social security number it, it enables us to locate a credit credit report verify previous employment and verify a merchant's identity um, also it's required for us to have to board the account on the the fiserv network uh, we absolutely need that social security number um, and in, if the merchant is looking to accept American Express, that is also, it's, it's required. Um, in addition, it, it allows us to assess the, uh, it allows us to get the credit report and it allows us to assess the financial character of the signer. Uh, poor credit may require additional documentation. If we see missed payments on credit cards, mortgages, liens, et cetera, uh, we may feel as if the merchant may not take any fees or debt payments seriously from electronic payments. We're able to check, we're also able to check if there's an ID alert. With all the breaches that have happened, these have become more commonplace. If there's a phone number on the ID alert, we are required to speak to the principal. If there's no phone number, we generally, we will send a letter to the most recent address on file. We will reach out to the principal's home number and ask a few validating questions to clear the ID alert. We like to review the recent inquiries and previous employment on their credit. It helps us identify a fraud, fraud application. Many inquiries and a different place or industry of employment are red flags. So we may have somebody who's applying for a merchant account for a contractor, uh, for a general contractor, but they might be a teacher at a school or they might be a doctor or vice versa. And that kind of stuff does come out in the credit report. Um, we're able to search, sorry, we're able to search match. The social, social security number is required to search match to confirm if a merchant is on the TMF list. Merchants who have committed fraud or have had excessive chargebacks among other things are placed on this list. And finally, we can search OFAC. Uh, OFAC stands for the Office of Foreign Asset Control. This involves sanctions against certain individuals, companies, and countries. It's against federal law for us to conduct business with a person or entity that conducts business with or in a certain country, such as the Balkans, Belarus, Burma, Ivory Coast, Cuba, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Iran, Iraq, uh, Liberia, North Korea, Sudan, Syria, and Zimbabwe. Identifying a fraudulent account. There are many signs of a fraud account, but here's just a few. If the client finds you online, most fraud accounts we come across are web leads. It's very rare where we have a merchant that solicits your services uh, over the phone or in person and then goes on and commits fraud. 99% of them are web leads. Uh, please make us aware if you have any concerns about the source of the deal. I would say if your shop mostly does in-person deals and you get a web lead, let us know it's a web lead. It helps us prevent, uh, prevent us from accidentally approving an application. We may look at it uh, with a little more of a, a, a more direct eye than just as a regular account. Um, documentation may appear forged or invalid. We do see a lot of doc documentation every day and we've come across many fakes. Like I said earlier, the driver's license is the easiest, easiest to spot. Second on this list would be the voided check. It's easy to fake and most of the time easy to spot. <clears throat> Occasionally the signatures won't match with other documentation that is submitted. This isn't as common, but we've seen differences that give us pause. And the customer is in a rush and doesn't care about rates. If the customer is pushing very hard to get the deal done and says yes to everything without even blinking, including higher rates, that's usually a concern. Um, a lot of times customers will say, I have a lot of transactions I need to run. How soon can you get me up and running? And then as soon as the account gets approved, you'll see all those transactions come in for $499 uh, with a $500 average ticket. And then they'll disappear off into the sunset if they've put through about $5,000 worth of those transactions. So next up is identifying a fraud account. Um, so there's card not present and there's, there's card present merchants. Um, the more information, the better. 
merchants that operate in the card not present space tend to have a ho have higher rates of fraud because it's easier to use fake card numbers and go undetected. It's very important we work together to verify merchants that operate in a card not present space. Get as much information as possible. It'll be easier easier for us to approve or approve the account or identify if something is off. Uh, card present merchants are usually legitimate businesses and we can find a lot of information online. We may request additional information to cross-reference our findings. The best information to verify the business is pictures of the signage, stock, lease, um, et cetera, like we just discussed before. Um, home-based businesses are generally higher risk. If the merchant is a home-based business, a lot of times the information is not available online. The bad actor may be hoping for a quick approval, and many times the businesses that turn out to be fraudulent are contractors. This is why we ask for statements and some marketing, which could be a business card, a brochure, or pictures of a van to be submitted with the deal. So why do we ask for all this information? We have to follow guide, guidelines that are set forth by the acquiring bank to ensure we're upholding the integrity of the payments process. And the more documentation we receive, the better. It allows us to detect inconsistencies and prevent fraud. If we do find inconsistencies or the merchant has poor credit, we may ask for additional information. In addition to following guidelines, we must safeguard EPI from fraud and prevent us from being put in an undesirable position. Every merchant account that comes in we must assess the risk on, which is why filling out page two with the expected delivery timeframe and deposit percentage is so important. The bottom line is we want to know your customer. Our sales force is the first line of defense. You're the most important piece of the puzzle. You may see paperwork or have interactions with merchants that could raise some red flags. Let us know if you feel if you have any concerns. If you know your customer or the deal was through a good referral source, it lessens the likelihood of fraud. Let us know your background with that merchant, whether it's a family member, a friend, or he's been your customer for 10 years and you're switching him to EPI because we have the best stuff. It helps us in the process. If something doesn't feel right about a deal, share your thoughts with us as we will take an extra close look at it. If something seems suspect, um, let us know. It may end up being best to walk away from a deal sometimes. And keep in mind, we don't know your customer. We still may ask for additional documentation if we feel we need it or it's required by the bank. All right, so now we're gonna discuss some red flags here. There's many red flags for fraud that you need to be aware of. Um, internet leads, I harped on this a couple of times already. Not meeting your customer or if the customer finds you out of the blue, it's a red flag. Meeting or talking to someone over the phone gives you a better understanding of the applicant's intentions. If you have a team that is, uh, if you have a multi-state team or people located in different states where your home office is in one state and you're getting an online web lead near one of your, one of your team members, send that team member to check it out. Is it a legitimate business? Is it an empty warehouse? Does the address even exist? It's a, I mean, it, it helps, really helps. Um, the addresses, if the address is local to you and doesn't make sense, let us know. It's likely it's a questionable deal. Uh, email addresses on the MPA, there's a lot of information that can give off some red flags here. So email addresses typically so, associated with fraud accounts are older ones that are easy to obtain, uh, such as AOL, Hotmail, and Live.com. It doesn't mean the deal is fraud, but using the information coupled with other factors may lead us in that direction. These signed volumes, um, as stated before, if they don't make sense with the industry, it should be questioned. If you're getting an auto repair place that, you know, wants to have a, a $200 average ticket with a, you know, $800 high ticket, that doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, your average auto auto repair place, the high ticket would be between $7,500 and $10,000. And your regular average ticket should be around five hundred to you know a thousand dollars in auto repair. Just an example. Um, the business names. We have a lot of construction home-based businesses using the signer's name that are that are legitimate. But when we see the signer's name as the business name, it's a factor we do need to consider. And unusual business or legal name. Uh, repetitive words, a combination of letters and numbers, or a signer's name being used. Um, or a completely different name being used in the DBAs where 
say you have Steve's plumbing, but the signer is Joe Smith. That's a red flag. And of course, forged documents. As we talked about before, most forgeries are easy to spot. If you see something that could be forged, give us your two cents. This is a partnership and we welcome your assistance. By helping protect EPI, you're helping protect your profits. So each year, billions of dollars are lost as a result of fraudulent transactions taken at merchant locations. This includes all the credit card, all of the card fraud that occurs along with the cost to issuers, acquirers, and merchants. <clears throat> There's been a sharp increase in, um, in ID theft in the last few years. And uh, Rhode Island leads the, because they're the smallest state, they lead the most with the, with the reports. But generally speaking, um, Illinois and Georgia and uh, a couple other states have the highest reports. Oops, excuse me. So the risk overview, what is risk? What are we gonna cover? So we're gonna cover uh, what risk is, how we calculate it, the different types of risk, uh, the types of fraud and risk mitigation. So what is risk? It's an estimation or actual financial harm a merchant's business can do to the merchant provider. Uh, EPI is essentially offering a line of credit. All merchants provide products or services that have an assumed quality assurance, meaning the merchant will deliver a product on time, accept returns for the product, and guarantee that quality of the product. If the merchant does not deliver the product on time or at all, does not accept returns, or produces a below average product, customers will not be satisfied, which results in refunds, or worse, chargebacks. It's all about customer perception. If customers feel like they were overpromised on products or services and feel undersold, they will complain. And if their complaints are not met, they will turn into chargebacks. And if the merchant cannot pay for their refund or chargebacks, the merchant provider, electronic payments, were on the hook. So what drives the risk? There are, valuable, there are variables that mitigate and elevate risk. So longevity, um, a newer business increases the risk. The longevity of the business speaks to its success and customer satisfaction. A new, a new business doesn't have that track record. So more documentation may be requested on the front end, or if the merchant processes a sale above their high ticket and they're newer with us, uh, we may be asking for additional information, uh, more so than the business that's been with us for, for five or 10 years. <clears throat> Stability. A financially unstable business lessens our confidence that the business will have the means at any given time to cover the risk. This can be evidenced in financials or bank statements. Low banking with negative balances and overdrafts are a big concern, and financials may indicate downward trend in business stability. So we may require financials on uh, some multi-million dollar merchant accounts. Um, and those financials, uh, if they show a downward trend in their stability, then there's a likelihood that the account could be forced to tier two or may, out, may be outright declined. Um, but when it comes to the risk process after the fact, after the account is approved, uh, merchants, process, merchants may be subjected to periodic reviews, and we may be requesting financials at that point. And if something changes, then that is something that we have to, you know, that is something we have to discuss with the merchant. <clears throat> the industry. Certain industries pose more risk than others due to delivery timeframes and the ability to attract fraudsters. As discussed, contractors of any sort create the most ID theft situations in our books. Uh, merchants that get victimized are usually done so over the phone, but sometimes a third party is in person making it seem more legitimate. Card present. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Card present is inherently safer than card not present. Restaurants are generally the safest in terms of credit risk, as people will only pay if they're satisfied. The customer has control. Customers are paying and leaving a retail store with a product. A chip and signature will reduce chargeback liability and allow that merchant to respond to a chargeback if one does occur. Um, E-commerce customers uh, rely on third parties to source the product and ship it, which will take multiple days. Uh, that, that is, uh, excuse me, that's 
drop shipping is high risk because the merchant doesn't have control over their inventory, along with the future delivery aspect of it. Uh, Service-related industries, such as travel agents, contractors, web designs, et cetera, all have varying timeframes, but most of them require a deposit with an extended delivery timeframe. The processing, processing history, if the previous account uh, was in good standing with us, it's likely the new account will be as well. If there's a collections balance on the previous account, that will need to be cleared up uh, prior to us reviewing a new account. Credit score shows us an overall picture of the principal's financial character. Uh, do they make payments on time? Are they in collections? Do they have established credit? Do they have an ID alert? How many recent inquiries? The answers to all those, all those questions affect our judgment on whether or not the merchant can support the risk. And the billing method. If the merchant has recurring billing, they need to be mindful to turn it off when a customer cancels. Otherwise, chargebacks may occur. In addition, if a customer grows upset, they may be liable, they, they may charge back all, all everything that has been charged in their card. So it is a risk to have recurring billing on a merchant account. Types of risk. There are two subsets of risk. There's actual versus potential. Actual risk is real dollars and cents that we can label as our risk that's been processed through the merchant account. Um, it, this is common with fraud-centric transactions. So if we have a merchant that's processed $5,000 in fraud sales, that's $5,000 in actual risk that we're going to lose or that we're at risk of losing. Uh, potential risk is the estimated, estimated amount EPI is at risk for an account. Usually it's only realized if a business failure occurs with an extended delivery timeframe. Transactions could be disputed because of non-delivery of products or services. End of month fees are also taken into the account. And then there's fraud versus credit risk. Fraud risk involves accounts open with a stolen identity where a legitimate merchant is victimized or collusion scenarios. We've come across many business, business ID theft situations in the last couple of years. They're mostly internet leads. Again, the internet, don't accept deals from the internet. Credit risk, furniture stores with a 30 day delivery timeframe processing $100,000 per month carries a risk of $100,000. The risk is mitigated using our findings from reviewing the merchant's credit score, statements, longevity, and stability. If you know the delivery timeframe and underwriting, please share with us in an email or make sure to fill out the, the section appropriately on page two. Um, this credit risk falls in line with the potential risk. So if the business goes out, of, if the furniture business goes out of business, we can assume that we're gonna take a hit of $100,000. It's not always true, but that is a, that, that is a good starting point. So we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of types of fraud out there, but I'm just going to talk about a few of them. Um, fraud comes in all shapes and sizes. The following are some more of the common types. So there's ID theft. Uh, common victims of ID theft include doctors, dentists, the occasional retail business, and any other profession where a lot of information is out there in the public domain. There's merchant fraud. Everything seemingly verifies a new business and account opened with the sole intent to commit fraud. There are occasions where we have a merchant that stays on, that, that's on with us for a year, and then all of a sudden they commit fraud or they choose not to deliver on product. Not that they go out of business, but they're choosing not to deliver on it, and uh, we are stuck with the chargebacks. There's collusion and bust out. Um, basically, I would have a merchant account, and you have a couple of cards using stolen identities, and if you want to run those cards through my machine uh, for cash advances... You can, sometimes this is coupled with bust out fraud where the cardholders will send payment and the issuer will send payment to the issuer and the issuer will raise the limit until that payment is processed and found out to be bogus. It's often the toughest fraud to spot. There's refund fraud, which is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, refunds are issued without the intent to pay. Uh, generally speaking, we capture the refund fraud before it actually happens uh, due to our, our PTS system. Uh, and then we also have counter, counterfeit fraud. Uh, the merchant is usually not involved. Card accounts are opened using stolen information. It's characterized by poor authorizations and sales done on multiple cards sharing the same issuers. Typically, the merchant is, asking, is asked to overcharge the cards and then wire funds to the third-party shipper. If a merchant calls in and is uneasy about any transaction, please notify us right away. You can email us at risk at electronicpayments.com. 
one of us will we'll review it and we'll take care of it. So here's some red flags for merchants. This is something you can educate your merchants with. Over the phone transactions, when business normally only accepts in-person transactions. This should be easy to spot for merchants, but a lot of times there is some kind of a story that the merchant that, that makes the merchant feel comfortable. And next thing you know, there's a truck to pick up a hundred tires or 20 bales of hay. And in 30 days, a chargeback rolls in. We've had it where somebody calls over the, um, the, the TTYL line and, and, and pretends to be a deaf person, orders catering, somebody comes and picks up the food and then a chargeback comes in after that. Um, they, they're getting, they're, they're getting creative. Um, sometimes the, the sale is too good to be true. It sticks out like a sore thumb, but generally the merchant believes they're making their month with this one single transaction. And oftentimes this is a bogus, this is bogus and leads to a loss for the merchant and sometimes EPI. And it sets that merchant back even further. The chip's not working. In this scenario, the card looks real, may even feel real, but the chip is false. This is a counterfeit card with a fake chip. It looks real, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the terminal and forces that merchant to key the sale in. We see this a lot of time with uh, liquor stores and other low risk retail shops. And sometimes it might be $50, $75 and very difficult to kind of spot and, um, and isolate. So we recommend that any merchant that typically processes chip red transactions continue to only process chip transactions. If there's a card that needs to be keyed in, don't key in the card. If you're getting a decline, don't accept the card from this, this customer, uh, especially when more than one card is being presented. This happens when the merchant receives one card and the decline happens, and then the customer produces another, another card, sometimes with different ABS information. Sometimes this will happen over text, over email, over the phone. <clears throat> Additionally, merchants may be presented with multiple cards and be told to process certain amounts. That's to stay under the, uh, to stay undetectable. Billing and shipping addresses are different. This one's a classic example, example of, easy, of easy to spot fraud. Merchants should always ship to the billing address. Occasionally those addresses will be different, but a lot of times in those situations, it's a larger company making those purchases and shipping to a subsidiary or uh, you know, a third party, something that's easily verifiable. And then the customer insists on setting up delivery. We touched on it uh, before. It's another example of clear-cut fraud. It's very easy to spot. Merchants should never wire funds to a third party shipping company. They should always set up their own delivery. If the customer is picking up the item, demand to see the card being used and rerun it as a chip transaction if possible. This will reduce fraud. <clears throat> phishing. I want to talk about phishing. We haven't talked about phishing um, in any of my previous webinars or presentations, but this has become uh, very rampant. Um, as evidence, we, we had an issue with uh, the ProCharge site. It was spoofed. Um, we had emails being sent out to our merchants and they were clicking on it and providing their information uh, for their pro charge, uh, their pro charge credentials, and it, it did create some havoc for our merchants. A ransomware is delivered um, mainly by phishing emails. The most common attempts are made by email using a spoof or a very similar domain. There's over 3.4 billion spam emails sent every day. 3.4 billion. That's a lot of emails. There are several types of phishing. Uh, phishing, excuse me. <clears throat> There's spear phishing, and these emails are sent to a specific person and has very specific details and may request some kind of a bill payment or bank transfer. Uh, there's whaling. This is less common with SMBs, the ones that we deal with, uh, but it's still a concern, normally coming from the CEO and preys on employees' willingness to follow directions. It usually will include uh, a request to, to transfer money. There's smishing and vishing. It's all the same stuff but it's using phone calls and text messages instead of emails. And there's angler phishing and bad actors will prey on people's reliance of social media and may mimic an account to extract information. So if you go online and you complain about your pizza at Domino's, you send them a tweet and there may be a bad actor acting as the Domino's 
as a Domino's Twitter handle, it may be different. It'll be different. It'll be very slightly different and they will try and extract information such as the name, uh, the credit card information used and, and all that stuff. And that's, I mean, that's more so for customers or, or cardholders, not so much for our merchants. Um, but one thing that our merchants need to be aware of is the everyday emails that they get or text messages acting as if they want to act as ProCharge. If they're seeing something as ProCharge, if they see anything from ProCharge in their email, in their text messaging, or on the phone, and they're asking to change the password, though that merchant should immediately call into our tech support line and talk to our tech support people only. They should not be doing it upon receiving a phone call or a text or an email. So how do we mitigate all this risk? There's risk that comes on, come, there's risk on every single account that comes through our door. From the small restaurant to the travel agency, everyone has risk. Uh, the big trend we've seen this year is where fraudsters are posing as car owners or fleet managers, getting cars repaired, using stolen cards to pay for services over the phone and sending a third party to pick them up. Um, as stated before, the information we find out about an account or principal in underwriting um, really helps make, mid, mitigate the potential risk we may encounter. And it continues after the account begins processing. The merchant needs to be involved. They need to be on the lookout for suspicious customers. They also need to be very wary of customers willing to overpay for product or asking, wire, asking to wire funds to a third party shipping company. Authorizations, multiple decline sales from the same customer usually equals fraud, especially if they're using different cards and keying sales. Almost a slam dunk when the chip doesn't work or they need to make a phone call during the transaction. Um, that's something I didn't discuss in the red flags is the, the phone call during the transaction. They may pretend like they're speaking to the bank or they may, but they're calling, they're calling the bank and then they're putting the merchant on the phone with the bank, quote unquote, the bank. And the bank says, this is okay. And to force the transaction through, we have seen it a lot of times in where the merchants are taking control of the term, I'm sorry, the cardholders are taking control of the terminal and putting in the information or issuing a refund to their own card. There's a lot of ways that fraud gets committed out there. Uh, merchants should always control the terminal. Um, they should always control their POS system. They should be, have the ability to uh, accept or deny any transaction. Uh, they should never allow the, the customer to key in their own card. We may ask for an invoice to validate a large sale or, if some, or something that seems off. Uh, we do this to not only protect ourselves, but also the merchant. If the merchant wants to raise their average ticket or high ticket, we may want to obtain bank statements uh, to confirm the merchant's financial stability. We have other internal controls that we utilize to identify questionable or higher risk merchants. And then reserves and shutdowns. Uh, EPI may feel it's necessary during a review to take a reserve on a merchant's account. Uh, reserves taken upon approval don't happen often. Um, we will, reserves will be taken one of three ways. Uh, by holding back all the batches, uh, or we can place a debit on the merchant's bank account or set the merchant on some kind of a rolling reserve to slowly, uh, to slowly build it up. So we might be able to hold a 50%, 50% of each batch or 15% or, or what have you. This is usually, uh, this percentage is usually agreed on with the merchant after a conversation. We also will do this to collect funds. So if the, if the trend, if the account is still open, then it's a risk issue. If the account's closed, then it goes to our collections department. But if the account is still open, the merchant has the ability to pay us back using the funds that they put through the merchant account. Uh, reserves may be held to offset ongoing risk the merchant may not be able to support. If an accountant has a reserve and we close it, we could hold those funds from two months after, the, after to a year. Okay, so let's wrap this up. Uh, fraud and risk mitigation start in underwriting. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound and cure. If we can prevent fraud before it starts, then everyone wins. Know what's needed prior to submission. Uh, refer to this deck, the underwriting guidelines, email underwriting with an inquiry or email me directly. Uh, risk comes in all forms and may never be realized. 
From the mom and pop convenience store to online furniture store, risk varies and possible losses could come from, could come from anywhere. Know your customer. I can't be stressed enough. This will undoubtedly help in avoiding fraud accounts. It will make it easier for you to obtain documentation now and in the future. And don't take internet leads unless this is your bread and butter and you have a proper vetting process. Uh, we also will need to mitigate risk by holding reserves at times, but we'll do everything else before gathering a reserve. Uh, we do our best to lessen the impact on the merchant, but the main focus is to receive payment on any outstanding debts and prevent any future losses. And we're all on the same team with the same goal. Prevent fin financial harm to the merchants and to EPI and to make a ton of money doing it. And lastly, we have our questions page. For general underwriting or risk needs, please email underwriting at electronicpayments.com or risk at electronicpayments.com. If somebody is not getting back to you, please contact me directly. If I'm not getting back to you, contact me more. Annoy me and I will get back to you, I promise. And let's see, let's go through these questions here. I see we have a few. Let's see here, up in there, okay. Okay, so we have one here, it says, we, will we ever be able to approve merchants without a permanent check or bank letter? Uh, some bank, some payment service companies don't require it, um, ba, ba, ba. so that's a good question. So we don't always require a, uh, a bank, excuse me, avoided check. Um, or even a bank letter. Um, we do have a, a third party verification system that we use. So generally speaking, if we have the, mer the, the bank account information, we are able to verify and we're able to verify that as it's an authorized account, excuse me, it's a, the signer is verified and the account number is open and valid with a positive track record. We're able to just use that system to um, we're able to use that system in place of a voided check or uh, a bank letter. And we have another question. How would we be able to approve dropship merchants where in many cases are shipping from a third party and not directly from the merchant? That's another good question. Um, the best way to do it is the best way to allow us to, I'm sorry, the best way to uh, allow us to feel comfortable approving these kinds of accounts is financial information, bank statements, showing us that there's a lot of money involved. That always makes us feel a lot more comfortable. Uh, cash is still king. So if we see that the merchant has a sufficient amount of funds in there to satisfy any risk concerns, then that's, generally speaking, that's how we can get these kinds of accounts approved. Okay, can you give us any additional tips uh, that you can give us to better help merchants protect themselves from chargebacks? Uh, most chargebacks are from CMP transactions. Um, AVS, ZIP, CVV, and shipping to the billing address. Um, are there any other tools? So there is, there is a tool that, um, that a third party company comes out with, or excuse me, that, that you, that's utilized. Uh, it's called 3D Secure, but this is generally for e-commerce merchants. Um, e-commerce merchants can utilize this 3D Secure. Um, I think it's through a company called Cardinal. I can't remember the name of it, um, but they're able to sign on with this, this company and they essentially guarantee the fraud chargebacks. If there's any fraud, uh, they, they're able to guarantee it because their program should be stopping that fraud before it settles to the merchant account. <clears throat> but as far as over the phone transactions or something of that sort, it's very difficult. The merchant needs to use their intuition, uh, their gut, and they need to strictly follow. The, if they get an, a no on the AVS match, they shouldn't be accepting the card. Um, it's I know the AVS information, you still get an approval code, but you may get an N for the AVS match, and that should be a red flag to uh, not accept the transaction. Unless, of course, it's an insurance carrier or something where there's a, an extenuating circumstance, that is always a, a twist on it. But 
a run of the mill transaction where somebody is calling in ordering lumber and they're getting an AV, they're getting an, a no match on the AVS, they should be accepting a different form of payment. Okay. Uh, Megan, do you want to open up the phone line, see if there's any, any questions that people want to, uh, to share vocally? Surely, if any of you are joining us on the phones, you can press star nine to raise your hand and I can unmute your phone, or you can simply press star six. I also, excuse me, I also see one other question. Um, how often does EPI receive a deal that we identify as fraudulent? Um, I'd say uh, we see two to five deals a week that are uh, fraudulent. Um, it varies from week to week, but in generally during the pandemic, we did see a lot of fraudulent uh, attempts. Um, nowadays, we're seeing a lot more fraudulent transactions coming through. The fraudsters took a break from processing stolen credit cards. So instead they were trying to open up uh, fraudulent accounts uh, during the pandemic. But you know, now we're back to, now we're back to fraudulent transactions. It's a lot of fun, a lot of stuff going on. All right, who's got questions, anybody? Comments, concerns? Uh, I'd like to, if I could, just address a question that I saw come in um, quite a few times. Um, the marketing team hosts our blog on the corporate website, which is electronicpayments.com slash blog. And on there, we have a blog currently that focuses on fraud prevention, specifically for online businesses. If that's something that uh, you would like to have a PDF version of and perhaps co-brand, you can reach out to the marketing team at marketing at electronicpayments.com. And we will also um, be posting a updated chargeback blog in the next week or so. So keep an eye out on that and feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type those in now. I think we've hit them all, um, but you can certainly submit those. And James, if you just want to roll on to that last slide there, um, and we'll cover our next two webinar topics that sure. are upcoming. All right, Megan, please discuss Perfect. our upcoming <laughs> webinars so our <laughs> agents can become more educated. Thank you. Uh, in a little less than a month, we are hosting another ProCharge webinar. This one will focus on ProCharge Desktop and be hosted by Adam Gottheim, our Director of Strategic Partnerships. And he'll be covering some market and sales opportunities, product features and capabilities, um, and some helpful resources that we have to help you out um, in selling that solution. And then after that, we have a... Deliver Me, another Deliver Me online ordering webinar. And this one will be covering some tips that you can use for this product. It will dive into the standalone online ordering solution, how it fits into your product lineup, some conversation starters and sales tips. Um, so be sure to join us for both of these. And you can register again on our corporate website at electronicpayments.com slash sponsored events. Well, thanks, Megan. Appreciate that. No problem. I don't see any other questions coming into the chat. I guess I explained it pretty well. <laughs> or everyone fell asleep. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, if anyone has any questions, uh, I hope you all took note of James's phone number and e the email address for risk and underwriting. Again, that's underwriting at electronicpayments.com and risk at electronicpayments.com. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out. Otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us today. And I hope that we see you on our next two upcoming webinars. I thank did. I, oh, as Megan, ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. I did. It's I got okay. one. I got a buzzer beater here. All right. Do um, it. What practices can card present merchants use to protect themselves from fraudulent cardholders that are professional chargeback scammers that are simply trying to get free products or services? Uh, well, first and foremost, um, a signed invoice or some kind of, if this is a, uh, a retail store that only gives out uh, a, a, a broken out invoice, a receipt, excuse me, that just shows what was purchased, um, it's kind of tough to, to navigate that. Uh, but generally speaking, those professional 
chargeback scammers. I mean, if they, they have an ID or something, um, those are those people are hard to uh, prevent from actually completing the transaction. It's kind of like you have to make the mistake, then you know who it is and you don't sell to that person anymore. Um, but if it's a merchant that is larger that provides pro uh, larger products or services, uh, a signed invoice explaining exactly what was done, and that invoice should indicate that I'm signing here because I am satisfied with the work that has been completed, I am satisfied with the products that I have received, and it has to be signed by that customer. The transaction, again, because it's card present, should always be chipped, never keyed. And I, I hope that answers that question. And I think that's it. Okay. All right. Okay, Megan, wrap it up. <laughs> wrap it well, up. Well, once again, lunch. thank you all so much for, for joining us today. And thank you, James, uh, for your time. Oh, we have one last one. I apologize, uh, James, if you want to take that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this. Um, so for merchants that are card not present and process a transaction over the phone or via pro charge, um, will sending a DocuSign form to the cardholder be of any help, even though the payment is not embedded in the DocuSign? Uh, generally, no, it won't be of any help, the, not from the issuing bank standpoint. Um, it, it may assist in verifying the IP address and where that customer is uh, generally lo generally located, uh, but card not present and fraud, it's still very easy for the banks to just say yes to it. Um, it is possible that if the customer has previous history with the merchant that this will help, but then that customer would usually wouldn't dispute the transaction. Great questions, you guys. Any last outstanding questions you want to add in? We're here. I appreciate everyone's contributions into helping us, you know, fight, fight fraud. It's important. We are all on the same team. I know underwriting and risk. I know we can be thorns in your side sometimes, but uh, we appreciate your assistance. Uh, we appreciate your eyes on these merchants, on the paperwork, on everything, because as you can imagine, you know, we're getting a ton of paperwork every month. Occasionally something will slip through uh, and, you know, occasionally something will slip through risk and it's, it's not fun. Um, but the less, the, the more that we can do on the front end, um, the better prepared we are on the back end and we're able to uh, focus our energy and resources on, on that kind of stuff. Well, great, guys. With that, uh, I think we're going to wrap up for today. We'll be sure to um, send a recording to all of you who have joined us today, along with the presentation. And we will post on our digital channel and bank card forum. James, thank you again so much for your time today. Very much appreciated. And thank you all for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for having me.